Katie Strong from yes. okay. Educational Leadership is here, and so I guess you know, one of our tasks is to find out all these hidden connections between the two talks today. So, I, I, yes. you know, so yeah, um, and we'll open up for questions for everybody afterwards. Thanks. Go ahead, Katie. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have people in here seen Monty Python before? Yes? yes. Okay. So now for something completely different. <laughs> Thank you. Um, after I get mic'd up. Uh, yeah, I can stick this on my, on my waistband of my pants. Is that okay? Um, okay, so um, let me go just back one. Okay, so yes, uh, my name is Katie Strom, and um, I have the immense pleasure of representing the Educational Leadership Department here at Cal State East Bay. Um, and uh, I I'm originally from Alabama, but I've spent most of my adult life in California, with except for a small stint on the East Coast where I got my doctorate at Montclair State University. Montclair State University is a historical teaching university, one of the first in the country to have a doctorate in teacher education. So that's um, what my background is, teacher education and development. Um, and so uh, I, I still study um, how teachers move their learning into practice, but I also study my own practice. And so that's where uh, this presentation comes in. So um, one of my other passions is post-human theory. I'll talk about a little bit about what that is in a second. Um, so this presentation is about how I put post-human theory to work in teaching. Um, and I'm gonna, I, although I think you can do that across disciplines, I'm gonna contextualize it by giving an example of preparing critical scholar practitioners in our social justice focused EDD program, the Educational Leadership for Social Justice EDD. Um, so to set the stage, um, right now, we are in troubling times, to say the least. We have ethno-nationalist movements that are um, growing across the world, not to mention in the United States here. And those are doubling down on individualistic worldviews, and they operate via fear of difference. These translate directly into our schools, where we have a dramatic increase of racialized, misogynistic, xenophobic, and homo and transphobic uh, language, symbols, and acts. Um, there's a Southern Poverty Law Center um, survey where you can read about this, where nine in 10 teachers are reporting um, increased language and symbols and acts that are racialized, xenophobic, homophobic, and so on. Um, very problematically, in the United States, even though this is happening, teachers and leaders are socialized into ideas, uh, the idea that they have to be objective and apolitical, that they could ever be objective and apolitical. So my argument that I'll make throughout this presentation um, and the way that I approach my teaching is that we have to prepare teachers and leaders to think differently in these complex times. We need them to think in multiplistic ways, in ways that are explicitly political, in ways that are connected and fluid, um, and importantly, in ways that consider difference as productive, as a creative force. So one of the ways that I think we can approach this different preparation of educators or getting them to develop a different mindset is by using theories like critical posthumanism, which decenter humanism. Um, and so critical posthumanism I could give, I could talk about this all day long, but just to summarize it in a few key ontological shifts, and by ontology I mean the way we live in the world, the way we exist in the world. It's a, it's a vital materialist perspective, so or self-organizing intelligent matter, and it, like I said, it's about positive difference, difference as a creative force. And these are three um, key characteristics is a shift from dualism, so seeing the world as totally separate, um, as being able to cut up into binaries and hierarchies, and moving to monism, which is we're all together, but we're not the same. We're just all connected up. Next is moving from, the, from that individualistic standpoint, the idea that I'm an autonomous actor in the world, I am isolated, I have a bounded body, to a reference point of multiplicities or assemblages. Assemblages are like constellations, and they're human, non-human, discursive, material elements, and they all share distributed agency. They all share agency, rather than the human having control of everything and being able to, to, um, to do things. So from the third one is moving from objective and neutral and universal, as I mentioned, thinking of teachers as being able to be apolitical or researchers as being able to be objective, to 
a paradigm that is accountable, that is explicitly political, and that situates within particular power structures and geopolitical and material conditions. Another way to think about this shift is arborescent thinking and rhizomatic thinking. So um, my favorite philosophers, Deleuze and Guattari, call arborescent thinking the oldest and wariest type of thought. And there's particular characteristics. This is humanist thought. It's essentialized and universal, right? It comes down to the one. Everything is reduced down to the one. It's dichotomous and binary, right? So it proceeds by binary, by cutting up and moving up and reproducing itself. Um, and it's fixed and static. It's rooted to one place. Um, so this is problematic because if you just have one thing and it's rooting up and it's growing up and it's just reproducing itself, that means you're closing off possibilities for different thinking, which means you're reproducing the status quo over and over and over. Um, and then another major problem is it creates this false sense of objectivity <coughs> because this has been the dominant way of thinking for 400 years. It's become extremely internalized, which then obscures the fact that it comes from a very specific political location. This is not just value free. It's Eurocentric thinking. It comes from um, uh, 17th century Europe. And so it represents that political location. So the alternative and rhizomatics is synonymous with posthumanism. It's just another name for it because it builds off of the rhizome, which is this scientific figuration right here. Um, so it consists of many heterogeneous elements that come together, they connect, and they explode. So they come together, and every time they connect, they produce something new. So that's what we mean about positive difference. Difference is a creative force as these connections are happening. It's constantly changing. That's where the vital comes in, of vital materialism. And because all these elements are coming together and they're producing these new things, that's where you open up new possibilities um, for unthought or unimagined ways of being in the world, of teaching, of leading, of researching. But learning to think in these very different ways is really difficult. It's hard work. Um, and in particular, these are ideas um, that break away from common sense thinking patterns, right? So I argue that insights from sociocultural theories, which is probably our most dominant learning theory right now, um, in, at least in the education fields, um, so concepts from sociocultural theories, and especially the concept of scaffolding, can help us introduce these ideas to students and then help them, help them engage with them productively. Um, so some key insights, and I'm going to apologize in advance if this is review for folks in the audience, but some key insights from, from sociocultural theory is that learning is social and co-constructed. It happens first in relationship. Um, it's active. You have to do it. You have to do something. Um, participate in something. Learning is mediated by material and symbolic artifacts. So in other words, you have texts, you have different kinds of materials, uh, handouts, um, you know, maybe it's manipulatives, but then you also have symbolic artifacts, which is like language, discourse. Um, learning happens ahead of development in the zone of proximal development, which I'll give you more information on in a second, with appropriate supports. So learning doesn't just happen. You don't just develop in a lockstep manner. You have to be pushed and supported in particular ways to learn. And then the whole learning process is apprenticeship. So students begin as novices, or what we might call peripheral participants, and as they practice, as they get appropriate supports, they become more central participants over time in relation to specific sets of knowledge and skills. Um, so I want to spend just a second talking about the zone of proximal development. This is um, Lev Vygotsky's definition, so I'll give you a second to, to read that. So the zone of proximal development is what the student can do with help from others, with appropriate help from others. So here you have the zone of self-regulation. This is what the student can already do. Doesn't need any help, can do it totally by herself. Um, this is the zone of frustration, which is, it's just right now, that's too far beyond, right? But here is the sweet spot. This is 
the ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development, where you can have a scaffold, which is any kind of flexible support that helps students move to autonomy. So it could be a probing question, it could be a graphic organizer, it could be a model of something, tons and tons and tons of different examples. So the other thing about scaffolding is um, Lev Vygotsky defined it as uh, an expert other or a peer that has more knowledge, but other folks in sociocultural theory have taken it up and expanded it. So it could be an expert other, it could be a peer with more knowledge, it could be an equal peer when you're coming together and you're grappling together um, and you're working out the understanding and co-constructing. Um, and then it could also be internal resources. So maybe it's study skills that you've developed over time or you're in the habit of asking yourself questions or you're taking notes in the margin. Um, those are self-supports as well. Okay, excellent. So key takeaways. Um, okay, so if we're going to prepare teachers and leaders to develop these more complex ways of thinking, we have to move away from lecture dominant models. Instead, we want to support them to engage with the complex theoretical concepts that I was talking about earlier. We want to do that through carefully crafted and participatory activities that are ongoing over time. And we want to do it in ways that help students bridge from what they already know into the unfamiliar in really well-supported ways that integrate social interaction or dialogue and are mediated by really thoughtful, physical, and symbolic um, artifacts. Okay, so really thinking about the ways that we're using language and the ways that we're supporting. So the example that I'm going to give um, to kind of show how that contextualizes into my classroom is called the parable of the three researchers. And it's an activity that I developed. Um, it's been in development over the last three years. And it's gone through several iterations. And um, basically, it's a, a set of three narratives that I wrote myself. And each narrative features um, a different EDD student. And they're fictional EDD students, but I wanted my students to have some somebody that they could recognize. They could recognize, not necessarily themselves, but it was somebody, a, a familiar, almost, you know, caricature. So, does that look like it's gonna work? Yeah. Okay. Okay, you can just go from there. Go ahead. Yep. Okay, excellent. Okay. Okay. So um, my objectives then with the lesson are I really, want, I, I, I really want the students to rethink the notion of themselves as researchers as being able to be objective or separate from their research. And I want them to begin to develop an assemblage view of researcher and research. And remember when I said an assemblage, it's that constellation of human and non-human um, and material factors, right? So it's this sort of mixture of things. Um, so basically how it goes is uh, there was once three scholar practitioners who all were in their last year of an EDD program. And they were also all interested in the same problem, the quote, achievement gap, disparities in academic achievement between students of color and their white and Asian peers. And um, this is probably too small for you to see, but this is um, 10 years of data from the um, NAEP, which is uh, an international, uh, which is a, a, a test that we use to gauge sort of where our students are, how they're achieving. Um, and so you can see um, our Latino students are here uh, and uh, African American students are here. And this is white and Asian right here. Um, so despite that common interest, all three of the researchers developed very different projects, which then um, had them, of course, have very different findings, and then it would do very different things in the world. So typically, uh, I'm gonna walk you through how I would do the activity, but for right now, I just wanna give you a sense of who these people are, um, who these researchers are, and uh, I also wanna acknowledge the irony of me lecturing to you about something that should be a very participatory activity. So um, just having to say that. So Bob is uh, researcher number one. And he's a white guy, he's from a wealthy suburb in New Jersey, he's a football coach and uh, becomes a principal in a middle class district. He was attending an EDD program that was focused on accountability. So as principal, his black and brown students are not achieving at the same levels as his other students. So he wants to find out why. 
He names his project Solving the Problem of the Achievement Gap Among At-Risk Students. He decides he wants to interview his teachers and he frames the interview as, why are black and Latino students in, our, in your classes doing so poorly? Okay, so that's Bob, that's his research project. Gloria is second. Gloria, a Latina, grew up in a high poverty area in, in East LA. Her family migrated to the United States when she was seven and she was undocumented until the age of 15. She was also classified as limited English proficient or LEP for most of her schooling. Later in life, she becomes a bilingual teacher and because of her experiences, is a fierce advocate for multilingual learners. She also decides, based on her experiences, she wants to attend an EDD program that focuses on critical pedagogy. So, meanwhile, multilingual learners and her students in the previous year had had the lowest test scores out of all groups. And so she wanted to find out how can we better support multilingual learners through, through powerful pedagogy. So she plans a project called Assets-Based Approaches to Powerful Learning for Multilingual Learners and then she conducts in-depth case studies um, with three exemplar teachers to document their practice. Finally, we have Asada. She's a black woman from a high poverty neighborhood in Baltimore, Maryland, who, who herself experienced, quote, cultural mismatch in her school. And cultural mismatch is when your language and your behaviors um, don't match the expectations. And so they didn't match the expectations of her mostly white teachers. And so she was punished quite often for that. Um, she became a principal in Baltimore and she notices the same thing happening in her school. So she's interested also seeing that her black students are underachieving. She says, how might cultural mas mismatch be impacting black student test scores? So she decides a two-part study. The first part of the study, she interviews students of color regarding how they perceive the test and how it might impact their self-esteem and attitude towards the school. Then she conducts a content analysis of the test using a frame of cultural mismatch. So the students get these narratives, and I first have them in expert groups read one of the narratives, right? So I have three different groups, they're reading one narrative each. So they first read individually and they take notes in the margins, and then they get together with their group who all read the same narrative, and they, a and they um, answer in a column. Actually, let me pass out the graphic organizer. Also, as I mentioned, um, in this activity, they, um, they go all the way through findings. Let me pass those out. Um, yeah, thank you. They go all the way through findings. I just focused here, because I have a short amount of time. I just focused here on the first part, the design of the study. But you can see the graphic organizer here. So in their expert groups, they're only filling in one row. If they, if they had Bob, they're only filling in Bob, OK? So they have to work with their group to come to consensus. Next, they go into heterogeneous groups. So typically you would number off by whatever, you know, figure out how many groups you need. You know, if you have enough, maybe they number off by five. And then you have five different groups, each of which has representation from those original expert groups. So there's one representative from each narrative. They share the key ideas across. And the other students have to listen carefully. And they have to write down the key ideas from the other two researchers. Um, and then when they're done with that, they discuss across stories. What were some of the common dimensions that were shaping the research studies? And they come to consensus on a possible moral of the story. So some of the key things that students pull out typically um, when we're looking at the dimensions that shape research, they pull out, well, the researcher background and identity was definitely a shaping factor. Their previous education and their, previ their current preparation in their EDD programs, the things they were interested in themselves, where they located the problem. Was the problem with the students? Was the problem with the pedagogy? Was the problem with the test? Um, they had particular access to context. They had particular institutional uh, influences. Um, there were sets of historical and sociocultural norms and discourses. They had particular ideas about theory and knowledge. Um, and they all took a particular um, approach to design their study, which of course would also determine the knowledge that was produced. So, so some of the key things that, um, it, you know, to summarize here is that research isn't something that's done or found by a distant objective researcher, but it's something that's collectively produced by an assemblage or a multiplicity of elements that are connected to and influenced by forces that are personal, political, sociocultural, contextual, and so on and so on. Also, 
as I had noted before, agency isn't something that's held totally by the researcher. Yes, she is an active agent in her research, but it's also distributed across this assemblage. All of these factors are collectively producing um, the study and its eventual impact. And then mapping out an assemblage like this and looking at the particular situated relations of power, influence, and interaction, um, I argue that that can help teachers and educational leaders not only develop um, grounded and accountable views of their own research, but also their own practices in their institutions. And then they can also, by doing that power analysis, they can say, huh, where are the spaces of agency for disruption of oppressive status quo? Okay. So to summarize the pedagogical piece, um, how were students supported to enter into critical post-human thinking? And again, if I had an hour, this is an activity that I would have done with you, and then we would have gone back and looked at this. It would have been a little more powerful. But so from the first part of the jigsaw, the scenario was recognizable to the students, so bridging from their own experience into um, the content. I had questions to focus their attention. They have a note-taking aid, a graphic organizer. They discussed in expert groups, and then they came to consensus, which is peer-to-peer -peer scaffolding. Um, in the second part of the jigsaw, they had the organizer. They also had to actively listen because there was an information gap that was created by the use of those different columns and those expert groups. Um, and then finally, there was discussion in heterogeneous groups and a coming to consensus, which again is peer-to-peer -peer scaffolding as they're co-constructing. Um, so this pedagogy is um, you know, I, I'm talking about an example that's specific to my own context, but this type of pedagogy is good for everyone, um, and it's good across disciplines. We need to move away from lecture-based models um, and, and into more sociocultural supported models. Um, so that's my presentation. Um, if you're interested in further reading on posthumanism um, or on any of the things that I've talked about, Rosie Bradotti, The Post-Human, that's a real foundational reading. Deleuze and Guattari, A Thousand Plateaus. Um, I have a piece that's an introduction to a special issue that I co-edited um, on in issues in teacher education on thinking with theory in an era of Trump. Um, I have a um, article that I wrote with our wonderful EDD director um, that has a, multiple examples of putting theory to work in EDD programs. And then this particular example comes from a book chapter that's currently in press. Thank you very much. You. Questions? Or do we? I just answered them all. <laughs> we can go home. We got it figured out. <laughs> so, I mean, your example that you were working on with your class it seems to be very relevant to us on this campus today, right? We're, we're talking about this all the time. So, yes. I mean, can we put post post human theories to work in? And are reducing our achievement gap here on our campus? Well, so first of all, um, I, it, I think that post-human theory is really good across disciplines because it helps us get outside the body. Um, so achievement gap is, um, so the way that it's used in education locates the problem in the student, okay. that there's an achievement gap. And so post-human theory would be really great to talk about the achievement gap because Instead, it asks to connect the human up to the multiple systems that it's the, the human body is embedded in, right? And so rather than talking about the achievement gap, we would say, oh, okay, there's a situation that's happening with these students. What are the relations of power that are going on? And how are those relations of power you know, materializing? And also, where are the spaces of agency? Um, smooth spaces, that's another Deleuzian term, right? Where we can push back and we can disrupt the status quo. Yes. So if you were thinking of sharing this as a framework for moving forward a campus um, in really reframing what does it mean to move students to their potential in terms of academic success, that what parts would you begin sharing with faculty? How do you unpack? these very complex ideas to start to move the conversation to another way of thinking about teaching and learning and that dialectic process. Yeah, I think there's a lot of pieces that could be used, but I think one of the most productive is actually um, not necessarily using post-human language, but coming from the idea of assets-based perspective. Um, post-human 
Post-human theory to me is fundamentally assets-based because it's about the creative power of difference. Um, and it says, rather than sameness, the world, the natural order of the world <coughs> is actually difference. And the strongest systems are the ones that have the most difference because the more difference you have, the more creative potential you have, the more things that you can create and opportunities that you have that you haven't even imagined yet, right? So I think that that's one thing. Um, our faculty on, on campus need to develop understandings of our students from an assets-based perspective, and they also need to decenter their understandings of instruction. Um, there is one dominant mode of instruction. Not all professors on this campus, um, and it's not just this campus, it's everywhere, right? And in fact, it's the way people have taught for a millennia. We have cultural scripts in our head of exactly what I'm doing right now. That's why I'm saying it's ironic. I don't do this in my own classroom. Um, but you know the talking head at the front of the classroom, and we have to disrupt that. Um, I think individualism is another entry point. Um, the teacher at the front of the room, the one teacher who then is doing teaching, um, you know, via the banking model, you know, filling t filling the students with deposits. So if you can decenter that and say, well, actually, the teacher um, does not produce the teaching herself. It's something that's collectively created with her students w within particular conditions with the particular content. And so if we could think about it that way, I think it might be easier to move to more collaborative models. Um, but I, we have to somehow really um, give ourselves permission to move away from the lecture-based model. We have to somehow understand that if we're working on more collaborative, you know, where the role of the teacher is more of the planner and the facilitator and the scaffolder, uh, the supporter, that that doesn't denigrate the, her PhD. It doesn't denigrate, like she's still the expert, or not the expert, but she's still an expert. Um, and, I, and I think that that's, that's a fear as well. So I think those are two productive entry points would be um, the assets-based perspective and then moving from the individual to the more collectivist view. Thank you. I bet you have more to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> So how, do, how do the students, do, do the students like it when you teach this way? They, they don't get nervous or? Um... No, um, I mean, there's two parts to this, right? So one of the pieces is, you know, teaching in a way that's consistent with sociocultural theory and teaching in a decentered way. Um, so that is a little complicated because I would say at the doctoral level, I don't get any pushback. Um, at the undergraduate level, however, um, and maybe at the master's level, there might be some pushback for a couple of reasons. One, because of that cultural script where you think that the teacher should be the one at the front of the room. And so, um, in fact, I was having dinner with one of our professors from the English department last night and he was sharing with me that he used to give negative evaluations on his teachers that taught in more collaborative ways because he's saying, I'm paying to hear what you have to say. I'm not paying to hear what my partner has to say, right? Um, so I think you might run into that, and I think that, um, you know, what I do is I actually um, sort of demystify my teaching um, philosophy and my pedagogy in the beginning of my classes. So as part of my syllabus presentation, um, as part of my syllabus, I include, like, the moves that I make anyway. Here are the different ways that I'm going to scaffold your learning, or, I'm, you know, you may see these things. But I also talk about this is my approach to learning, and this is the theory that's behind it. Um, so that they know what's coming and they understand that I have a rationale for it. It's not that I'm being lazy and I'm going to make them talk to each other because I don't want to teach. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, but in terms of the post-human theory, my students have loved it. They, um, it's one of these things where, again, it's difficult because some of the words are a little unwieldy and some of the concepts are a little slippery, but if you can put it into terms um, and scaffold in, in supported ways, students go, yeah, the world is really complex. You, teaching does not operate in binary ways. I mean, they recognize that right up front. Um, they recognize that um, there are multiple realities. Um, so there's a huge problem with saying that there's one truth with a capital T. Um, many of our students in our doctoral program are also students of color, and so they understand that the dominant narrative is the one that becomes truth with a capital T. So um, I've, on both counts, um, I've had a lot of success with this. Yes. I think, I think, Katie, wonderful information. Um, do you know any other uh, resources that we can <coughs> find that provide best practices, examples, 
for this kind of teaching and pedagogy? Do, do you know any, um, any, any other information on that? So when you say this kind of teaching and pedagogy, are you talking about post-human or are you talking about sociocultural theory? The one that you use in classrooms, yeah. Um, so post-humanism maybe, yeah. Yeah, so post-humanism, there's not a lot. It's really, um, really kind of what I'm doing. That's, oh, okay. that's really it. This is a very new field. Um, so post-humanism emerges out of philosophy. There's, it's really, I mean, it's coming from multiple fields. Um, uh, there's lots of people who are working on it in quantum physics. There are people who are working on it in the like studies fields widely, cultural studies, queer studies, post-colonial studies, um, feminist studies, and there's people who are working on it in philosophy, but it's just starting to come into education. Um, and it's coming into K-12 education and not necessarily into higher ed education. Um, so really, I'm, I'm the only one right now. And, and the other people who, the other thing is, when people write with these theories, they tend to do it in a very abstract way. Um, and so it, you don't have the really concrete examples. That's why this kind of stuff uh, is really important to me. This is part of my research agenda is we need to provide these really important examples uh, or concrete examples, and we need to be able to um, articulate how the theory is connected to the practice. Um, in terms of sociocultural theory now, there's a lot of work on that, and I, could, I would be happy to give you some resources on that for sure. I don't know if best practice, it won't necessarily give best practices because one of the things about sociocultural theory is that it needs to be um, really sort of translated into context, but definitely there'll be some principles like learning is social, learning happens ahead of development, you know, those types of things. I can definitely, in fact, there's one resource that I can think of right off the top of my head, I can send you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Katie, I happen to know <laughs> that you have any resources. I think where you're also thinking is how to put this into place in your own teaching. Yeah. And that there are lots of teaching resources that we can send around. Um, what's powerful is that, that Katie's opened up for all of this. This isn't a dichotomy in terms of, oh, it's on, it's on the student or it's on the teacher. It's the, the teacher as the facilitator of learning um, and an asset space <coughs> Mm -hmm. People can make an assumption that, yeah, I'm in the zone of proximal development because these, these students don't have very much. So I'm right here and uh, you really want to expand it. So what you saw there, right, there's a lot of accountability. You, you, even if you just look at, at this, if students come out at the end of the class completing something like this in a group and then able to talk about it, you can know whether they learned what you wanted them to learn. So there are resources in that area in terms of on the ground And if you're interested in teaching with posthumanism, um, it's not out yet, but there is this book, Posthumanism in Higher Education, Reimagining Pedagogy, Practice, and Research, that we have this chapter in. And the purpose of that book was to start to fill the gap that we have, um, because there is some posthuman work in higher education, but it's very abstract. So in this book, it's supposed to be really about concrete examples of practice. And I know for ours, we literally have you know, I have a modified version of this exercise, and then my colleague, Johnny Lupinacci, who's at um, Washington State, he has an activity where um, his teacher ed folks are learning from more than human teachers. Um, it's really fascinating. Um, yeah, so like learning from trees and, folk, you know, it's really interesting, really interesting, so, yeah. Is he a science educator? He's a science teacher educator. <laughs> yes, yes he is. He says the science yeah. <laughs> well, this is this is being taken up by a lot of science educators because it comes from um, new materialism comes out of quantum the quantum sciences. So um, I come more out of the philosophy piece um, because I came up through like Deleuze and Guattari and Rosie Bredotti, who are firmly in um, philosophy, and she's also in she also does critical feminist studies. Um, but there's, so there's this convergence phenomenon going on of like all of these different fields of critical complex thought. The critical is on a spectrum. There are some people who are doing posthumanism, like they have a, 
they have a billion dollar pro, um, project at Oxford where they're, you know, building robots and doing all kinds of things and it's the post-human future, but it has nothing at all to do with social justice. It just has to do with, you know, avoiding being, you know, becoming slaves to robots at some point in the future. Um, but, uh, but other folks are, are definitely saying, this is a different way of thinking and being in the world. And, you know, there, there are so many widespread crises happening all over, you know, from widespread poverty to environmental degradation. Um, you know, there has to be something. We have to start living differently. And teaching is a social activity at its fundamental root. And so we're living differently, we're teaching differently. Well, yeah, thank you very much. I just say thank you very much to both of our speakers. And uh, also thank you to, to Glenn. So there's some, a couple of really great talks. And we'll, Glenn, we'll have them recorded. We'll have them up on the website soon. So anybody who missed, missed uh, the talks today will have plenty of opportunity to watch them later. So, what website? Thanks. Your, the on, on the library website, the yeah, library website, you'll be um, on something called Canopy. So it, 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 it <laughs> takes a few weeks to get them up there. So you know, thank you very much for coming. Thank you to our speakers. Great talks. I really appreciate it. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.